neuroscientist, a professor in the University of California. And uh, over the past, I don't know, 35 years, I study uh, behavior, but on the basis of everything from genes through neurotransmitters, dopamine, things like that, all the way through circuit analysis. So that's what I normally do. But then, for some reason, I got into something else just recently. And it all grew out of one of my colleagues asked me to analyze a bunch of brains of psychopathic killers. And so this would be the typical talk I would give. And the question is, how do you end up with a psychopathic killer? What I mean by psychopathic killer are these people, these types of people. And so some of the brains that I've studied are people you know about. When I get the brains, I don't know what I'm looking at. You know, it's a blind experiment. They give me normal people and everything. So I've looked at about 70 of these and came up and saw a number of pieces of data. So we look at these sorts of things theoretically on the basis of genetics and brain damage and the interaction with the environment and exactly how that machine works. So we're interested in ex exactly where in the brain and uh, what's the most important part of the brain. So we've been looking at this, the interaction of genes, what's called epigenetic effects, brain damage and environment, and how these are timed. And how you end up with a psychopath and a killer depends on exactly when the damage occurs. It's really a very precisely timed thing. You get different kinds of psychopaths. So we're going along with this, and here's just to give you the pattern. And the pattern is that those people, every one of them I looked at who was a murderer and who was a serial killer, had damage to their orbital cortex, which is right above the eyes, the orbits, and also the anterior part of the temporal lobe. So there's this pattern that every one of them had, but they all were a little different too. They had other sorts of brain damage. The key thing is that the major violence genes is called the MAOA gene. And there's a variant of this gene that is in the normal population. Some of you have this. And it's sex length. It's on the X chromosome. And so in this way, you can only get it from your mother. And in fact, this is probably why mostly men, boys, are psychopathic killers, are very aggressive. Because, you know, the daughter can get one X from the father, one X from the mother, it's kind of diluted out. But for a son, he could only get the uh, X chromosome from his mother, so this is how it's passed from, from mother to son. And it has to do with too much serotonin during development. It's kind of interesting, because serotonin is supposed to make you calm and relaxed. But if you have this gene in, in utero, your brain is bathed in this, so your whole brain becomes insensitive to serotonin, so it doesn't work, you know, later on. And I had given this one talk in Israel just this past year, and it does have some consequences. And theoretically, what this means is that in order to express this gene in a violent way, very early on, before your puberty, you have to be involved in something that's really traumatic. Not a little stress, not being spanked or something, but really seeing violence or being involved in it in 3D. Right? That's how the mirror neuron system works. And so if you have that gene and you, have, you see a lot of violence in a, in a certain situation, this is the recipe for disaster, absolute disaster. And what I think might happen in these areas of the world where we have constant violence, you end up having generations of kids that are seeing all this violence. And if I was a young girl somewhere in a violent area, you know, a 14-year-old, and I want to, you know, find a mate, I'd find some tough guy, right, to protect me. Well, what the problem is, this tends to concentrate these genes. And now the boys and the girls get them. So I think after several generations, and there's the idea, we really have a tinderbox. So that was the idea. But then my mother said to me, you know, I hear you've been going around talking about psychopathic killers. And you're talking as if you come from a normal family. I said, what the hell are you talking about? She then told me about her own family tree. Now, she blamed this on my father's side, of course. This was one of these cases, because she has no violence in her background. But my father did. Well, she said there's good news and bad news. One of your cousins is Ezra Cornell, founded Cornell University. But the bad news is that your cousin's also Lizzie Borden. <laughs> now, I said, OK, you know. So what? You know, we have Lizzie. She goes, no, it gets worse. Read this book, and here's this Killed Strangely, and it's a historical book. And the first murder of a mother by a son was my great, 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 great grandfather. Okay, so that's the first case of matricide. And the book is very interesting because it's about the, you know, witch trials and how people thought back then. But it doesn't stop there. There were seven more men on my father's side, starting then, Cornell's, that were all murderers. 
okay? Now, this, you know, gives one a little pause, you know, because <laughs> my father, you know, my father himself and my three uncles in World War II are all conscientious objectors. They're all pussycats. But every once in a while, Lizzie Borden, like three times a century, and we're kind of due. And uh, so, so I... So the moral of the story is, you know, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, but more likely is this. <laughs> and we had to take action. Now our kids found out about it, and, and they all seem to be okay, but our grandkids are going to be kind of concerned here. So what we've done is I started to do PET scans of everybody in the family. <laughs> and we started with PET scans, EEGs, and genetic analysis to see where the bad news is. Now, the only person, it turns out uh, one son and one daughter, um, siblings, didn't get along, and their patterns are exactly the same. They have the same brain and the same EEG, and now they're as close as can be. But there's going to be bad news somewhere, and we don't know where it's going to pop up. So that's, that's my time. <laughs>